Hello. In this video, we're going to look at classroom group dynamics and how to improve your classroom. If we're meeting for the first time, for the first time, my name's Alistair, and I'll give you a little bit uh, about my history as a teacher. Uh, teaching has always uh, been my passion, right since I was at university, actually. Um, I wanted to be a teacher from about the age of 18 or, or 19. And something I'm absolutely passionate about. So in this video, <clears throat> we're going to consider how uh, both teachers and students can improve the environment of the classroom. Uh, it's something that people generally find very difficult. And that's what we're going to consider today. We're going to look about lots of things such as groups, the role of the teacher, uh, the role of the students. And hopefully this video, or if you're watching it uh, on the replay will help you no matter what age you are, whether you're a teacher or a learner, whether you're learning maths, whether you're learning English, whether you're learning any language, any subject at all, I believe this, uh, this video has something for you. Uh, also, I think there's content in this video that should help you uh, in lots of different ways in life. This isn't just something that has to be applied to the classroom. So welcome. See, there's a couple of people here. Hello, Wild Cruiser. Hello, Alexander. Uh, this is a live stream, so it's really important that uh, that people talk to each other, uh, let each other know where you're from. Uh, and this video is about uh, people sharing their experiences in the classroom. You may have some positive experiences, and unfortunately, you may also have some negative experiences. I'm going to share some of mine today. And you guys in the live comments, please share some of yours. Again, the purpose of this video is to, to improve the classroom from the point of view of teacher and students, how to improve the dynamics, because it's very, it's very rare that there's only one or two people you know, in a learning environment and how people interact together uh, can, be, can be super important. Uh, so, uh, some information about, uh, about why I decided to make this video. A uh, big shout out to my, my friend and former colleague, kind of boss in a way, a guy called James. Um, not this year finished, but the one before that, he, he ran a course in the school I was in, in, in Riga, in the country of Latvia, if you don't know this. And he was determined, uh, extremely motivated teacher, he was determined to bring psychology uh, into our training sessions. So uh, during his free time, he put together a course of eight or 10 weeks, I can't remember exactly, uh, really informative sessions. And it was about psychology in uh, foreign language learning. And there's all sorts of degrees and courses you can do about psych psychology. But uh, James, he, he realized that there wasn't actually very much in relation to, to education or those who were teaching a foreign language. We did a course and about 10 of us turned up absolutely fantastic. Uh, one of his sessions was about group dynamics. Um, so I'm gonna share uh, some of his thoughts today and uh, some of the thoughts he said that researchers had. But the actual, uh, the actual information that uh, prompted me to write today to, to make this video, because very last minute was, was a Facebook um, message I received. I'm, go I'm gonna share it with you if that's okay. Ah, uh, New York City again. Swamp Town in Riga, Latvia. Yeah. So someone sent me a Facebook message saying, uh, asking if I was going to do another live stream. I didn't do one last week, and uh, so I said, yeah, yeah, but you know, give me, uh, give me some ideas. And uh, this is what uh, what the person said. Um, <clears throat> so they wanted to 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 do a video considering how teachers and students bond, how the the classroom uh, relationship between people is. And they, they made this comment uh, about pedagogically. So I asked, you know, do you mean mentally or physically? And they said, pedagogically, uh, many people consider my ex maths teacher to be amongst the best teacher in the country with awards and everything. Uh, but to me, they were just destructive. Um, so thanks for the for the person who sent this uh, this comment. And it got me thinking that 
you know, teachers can be incredible for, for one person and maybe not incredible for another person. But surely it has to be more important than that. It's about the it's about the group dynamics. It's not just between the teacher and an individual student or the whole class student. It's about how how everyone interacts together. So that uh, this comment got me thinking and got the person who made the comment thinking. And we decided to to make this video about uh, classroom group dynamics and basically how to improve your classroom. So again, if you're if you're just here. This is relevant for, for teachers of any subject, any age, any level, and also relevant for students, any age, any level, any subject. And it doesn't just have to be for classrooms. This could be, I guess, in the world of business, maybe even in the world of family, that's kind of group uh, group dynamics too. Um, so yeah, let let them, let each other know where you're from in the, in the live comments. Let me know where you're from and uh, you know, share your experience. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get straight into this now with a question. Uh, let me know what you think in the in the comment section. What is a group? I'm asking you. What is a group? Hi, hello everybody. Hi, brother. Hi, Yogesh. Hi, Solanaz. Alexander. Nice to see you all. So here's a question for everybody. What is a group? Uh, I've got some ideas. Um, again, that my friend and colleague. James shared, and I'm going to share them with you. But I want to ask you, what is a group? What defines a group? All right, someone from India, nice. Good. New York City, India, Latvia. I'm from Belfast, Northern Ireland, a few different people. So yeah, please, what, what is a group? What, what makes something a group? What makes, what defines a group? What makes a, what makes a good group? And what makes a bad group? We've all been there. Any ideas? That's a lovely definition. A group is a collection of same-minded people. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to share some some thoughts from my from my former colleague James. Uh, he says that going along with a uh, with what Wild Cruiser says that a group there has to be interaction between members. If there's no interaction, whether that be physical or just speaking, that's not a group. There has to be a shared goal. So in a business, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the group has a shared goal of you know helping people, making money, providing a product, doing a service, I don't know, something like this. Uh, charities, uh, trying to help people, providing aid for a specific country, um, helping the homeless, Charities have a, hopefully have a very specific, clear purpose. Uh, obviously in the, the language classroom where I was, I hope, <laughs> I hope that the shared goal was that each individual, <coughs> excuse me, would improve their language in the way that they needed to. Did they need it for work? Did they need it for an IELTS exam? Did they need it just to travel? Did they need it to find what's called their, their L2 identity? And hopefully that's the shared focus that's in a language classroom. I taught maths for eight years in the in the UK and England, and <laughs> perhaps the goal I would say of most people in the school was to you know to get high uh, results in the league table. I don't know are there league tables in your country, but for me and my students, uh, certainly from my point of view, the goal well, you know was not just to pass exams; it was to create a healthy environment where students actually understood the mathematical concepts, and therefore by enable by being able to understand these concepts, they could pass exams because you know these are hoops that you have to jump through, certainly in the UK. I don't know about your country. So that was the shared goal to help people understand maths and enjoy it so that then maybe they could pass exams, go to university or do apprenticeship, an apprenticeship, get work, whatever it was they were looking for. Uh, James also says that a group endures for a period of time. You know, is a group three seconds, three minutes? I don't think so. There has to be something where it lasts a period of time. There's a bit of unity, things together. Now let's get back to these comments here. Anything else? A bunch of people with a common goal. Yeah, that's a nice simplistic way of putting, putting it nicely. What else makes a group? A uh, group, this is interesting. Um, I, let me know, does this happen or did this happen in your classroom? A group is held accountable for members' actions. So what does that mean? That I guess basically means that 
if you do something whilst in the group, you're responsible for it. You're accountable for it. Uh, so it's easy enough to understand that from a teacher's point of view. The teacher is accountable for whether or not the students improve in art, improve in physics, improve in whatever it is the teacher is trying to facilitate. But I also think the suggestion here is that uh, a student in a classroom, adult or child, they should also be in, in a small way responsible for the, the progress of the whole group. You know, everyone should be, should be working together. There has to be some accountability. And as we get into it, you will, uh, you'll discover that a successful group really has everybody coming together. It's not just, I'm the teacher, or this person is the teacher, and they're accountable for everything. If everybody in a group was accountable, I think it would make a much, I don't know, a much healthier group. I don't know, what do you think? Uh, there should be internal structure. Uh, regulation of entry, departure, and group rules. Yeah, fantastic. So that's three things. There should be a structure. So in, in, in the classroom, uh, it's quite simple. There's a teacher and then students. So when I was uh, teaching in, uh, in Latvia, there were a maximum of 12 students and there was one teacher. Quite a clear internal structure. And then there were maybe 20 or 30 of us as teachers. And then there was management, um, kind of assistant managers, managers, and then there was a director and an office staff, stuff like this, all part of a group, a company. Now, when I was in, um, in England teaching math, slightly different, there was maybe anywhere between 10 and 30, 35 students. And in some classes, there would have been a teaching assistant. I don't know if these sort of existed in Latvia, unfortunately, but the teaching assistants who would work alongside the teacher with specific students. And then there was heads of department, middle managers, uh, principals, assistant principals, business managers, office staff, stuff like this. So there's a very clear structure in the group. A regulation of entry departure. So the again, going back to my experience in Latvia, the courses I think were about nine months. There was a set number of hours, depending on your age, depending on your level, whether you're a child or an adult. This is when the course started. This is when the course ended. And you would maybe get a certificate if, if, if you completed the course. Uh, different for adults and sort of teenagers. And if you wanted to leave the course, uh, you have to sort of give the, <coughs> excuse me, give the director some notice for payment and things like this. Uh, and if you go back to school, my situation in the UK, I think if you stayed the whole time at school, you'd be in 13 years, six years in primary, two years in infant, four years in junior, then middle school, stuff like this. There's a, there's a set point where you start and where you leave. You know, a lot of people in the UK would leave at GCSE and some would move on to a level so this this also makes a group and group rules you know that's something they've said hope you guys have said some more interesting things about groups ah hi james uh so james is the person who i'm uh, i'm referring to i spoke to i spoke about a few minutes ago my former uh my former colleague and friend who read who ran a uh, psychology course for those teaching english or any language as a foreign as a foreign language and lots of the things uh, I'm sharing today are, are things that James shared with about 10 or 12 of us in, in Riga and Latvia. Absolute gold dust. There is, uh, there's a link um, in the description to the blog that if you haven't checked out this blog, you, you should go and look at it. I'm sure someone could maybe put it in the current friend, former colleague. Yeah, I'm maybe sure someone could put it in the, put it in the, what's it called, in the live comments as well. That would be great. Yeah. Okay, folks, I'm going to throw out another, another question for you here as we move on what uh, what makes a leader i'm gonna pause for a few seconds i want some feedback from you guys what makes a leader good leader bad leader let me know in the comment please comments please what makes a leader I don't know, there's probably a lag. <laughs> what makes a leader? Okay, got a great question here from Wow Cruiser. How do you break the ice from the beginning? The first one who speaks out is always labeled as a teacher's pet, so I never speak first in a class. Wow Cruiser, that is, that is fantastic. Thanks, James. Someone who sets an example in attitude and action. That's brilliant. So it's not, 
it's not just about attitude, what's happening here. It's about what actually happens in the classroom or the business. You've got to practice what you preach. You've got to walk the talk. The teacher should be showing. The leader should be showing, by example, not just saying, by example. Thanks, Alex. A good leader is a person who is adaptive and can lead all group members to the goal. Wow. <laughs> now, if I, <laughs> I think if we took someone who sets an example in attitude and action and someone who can adapt and lead everyone to the goal, I mean, that would be a brilliant leader. That would be an absolutely superb leader if you can bring everyone to the same goal. Because people have different reasons. You know, I was in the mass classroom, the English classroom. People are, people are learning for different reasons. People have different goals. <clears throat> and if you can somehow get everybody as far as possible to that goal, I mean, what, a, what an incredible leader that person would be. <clears throat> a person who pleases people while they hold authority over people. What do people think about that? person who pleases people while they hold authority. Yeah, <clears throat> I think having authority over people can be very difficult. <laughs> it's, it's extremely important. It's how, it's how structure in life happens. It's, it's always happened down through society. But there, there are certainly good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. And that's, that's some of the stuff we're going to, that we're going to explore today. Yeah. Okay, here are uh, some, <clears throat> some suggestions. A gentleman called Board Lewin has, uh, there's more than three, but he, he came up with three uh, that I'm gonna share. And this is again, uh, this is again stuff from James. Three leadership styles, autocratic, uh, democratic, and laissez-faire. Maybe someone could type those in the comments. Um, autocratic, democratic, and laissez-faire. Hopefully, I know. I, I'm supposed to be teaching English on YouTube, so we might actually learn uh, learn some new English <laughs> English language here. And there's a bit of French as well. Sorry for my pronunciation. So there's there's more than three. I mean, again, you can. What would be great is in the comments if if you could share which of these <clears throat> you've experienced, uh, whether you're a leader. So it's not just for the classroom, and which your teachers or leaders have been, maybe people in your family, were your teachers autocratic, democratic, or did they display laissez-faire? So, so what are these? Um, autocratic, basically, the, <laughs> it's one way of doing it. The leader makes the decisions. There is, there's no participation. There's no impetus given to the others in the group. And the leader just says, we're doing this. And maybe there's not even a justification or a reason for making this decision. Uh, this is autocracy. Um, you know, maybe in the past that some governments were run like this, and maybe unfortunately there's some countries in the world where it's still an autocracy. Um, so this is an autocratic leader. They make all the decisions, no justification, no reasoning, no responsibility given to the, the team within the group. Then democratic, we all know about this, you know, democracy, it's something that happened some years ago, and lots of our governments um, are democratic in theory. <laughs> So a democratic leader involves members in the decision. There's more choice, there's more freedom, and there's, there's some independence. It's kind of doing things together. Uh, and then the last one, laissez-faire, is French for let do or leave alone or let it be. And it means the members just make whatever choices they want. The leader kind of watches, and sometimes it's it can be a bit chaotic, a bit random, but more responsibility is, is given to the members of the group rather than the leader of the group. So there, there's three styles, um, autocratic, democratic, and laissez-faire. So a couple of questions, which are you? Uh, if you're a leader, which one do you use mostly? Or is it a combination? And we've all been in classrooms and in situations where there are other leaders, which uh, style did they have? Did, were they autocratic, democratic, or did they display laissez-faire? Let, let each other know in the comments, which do you think is the best? <clears throat> And does it matter? Does it depend on the age of the students? Does it depend on the level? Does it depend on if it's the first lesson, the last lesson, the fourth business meeting? If it's a, if it's a meeting with a, I don't know, where there has to be a negative bit of information shared? What about in the family? What about all these different situations? And, you know, can leaders change? 
which one should it be? Should, it, should teachers be autocratic, democratic, or display laissez-faire? Let, uh, let me know in the comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex, for typing in the comments. So, so there's, we thought about what makes a group. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. We thought about three different types of leaders. Uh, I'd now like to put the question to, to everybody watching to begin to start to share <clears throat> your experiences uh, with your teachers. So they can be positive experiences or unfortunately they could be negative experiences. They could be experiences where the teacher was autocratic and just told you what to do and that was it. Uh, experiences where the teacher or the leader was democratic and involved you in the decision making. Or they could be uh, teachers or leaders who just use laissez-faire and just sort of let things happen. So please, I would love to, I'd love to hear from you guys. And um, thank you for watching in the comments. What's your experience in the classroom? What's your experience with, with leaders? How did it all happen? Wild Cruiser, thank you for sharing, a little too deep. I just follow the flow in a group. That's actually important. What, what do you mean, Wild Cruiser, by, by flow? What do you mean by flow? James, I would go for democratic. So I know it's not necessarily a scale, but I suppose you could call this somewhere in the middle. Um, I think in, uh, <laughs> in certain countries, certainly my experience of Latvia, if I, uh, or I think if any of the teachers were laissez-faire with the students, nothing would happen. They wouldn't make decisions because <clears throat> certainly in my experience, the education system, they, they want the teacher to take the lead. You know, as a traditional leader, the teacher says this, the teacher tells us how to do this. The teacher explains to me the difference between the past simple and the present perfect, particularly adults actually, they expect this. So I think if you were to go from, I guess, being autocratic to being laissez-faire, you're going to get in some, you know, in some, in some trouble, <laughs> some problems, maybe nothing would happen, no decisions would be made. So I think democracy, you know, teacher, uh, how do you say, teacher, teacher-led democracy is actually, uh, you know, is, is probably a good way to go, yeah. So the vibe that everybody is contributing, that's a nice way of putting it. Um, and certainly in my what's now 11, 12 years of teaching, uh, teaching groups, I think it's really important that you have everybody contributing. The teacher can guide and facilitate, be the stage, uh, don't, be the, what is it? don't be the sage on the stage, be the guide on the side, fantastic little phrase. Teachers should be facilitating, making things happen in the classroom, making, making learning happen. This is a lovely way of putting it, while Cruiser Flow, the vibe that everybody is contributing, brilliant. <clears throat> Thanks, James, for sharing. As a student, I found that autocratic teachers created a conflictive environment, a battle between teacher and students, and students don't take responsibility for their own learning. Yeah. Like, I think as we, as society develops and becomes more modern, people like to be responsible for themselves. Nobody wants to be told what to do, right, from a very young age. People don't want to be told what to do. People want to be involved in things. People want to feel part of a community, part of a group. And, I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're thinking about in this video. How can we improve groups? And hopefully by sharing, I'm going to share some of my experiences, positive and negative, and by you guys sharing your experiences, we can actually you know help each other out, help help students and help teachers. Yeah. So yeah, keep if there's any specific experiences people have, maybe don't mention the name or the subject or the school. Uh, that's up to you positive or negative, like uh, like I read, or like I said at the start with uh, the teacher who um, from a country got all, got all these awards, uh, seen as a brilliant teacher, but one individual student who I guess started this, started this video, didn't have a good relationship with them and described them as destructive. If you have any experiences that, that you want to share, we can sort of chat through them and we can, we can hopefully help out. <coughs> uh, Alex agrees with you, James, nice. <coughs> So apparently Loon, going back to the three types of leaders, <clears throat> again, thank you, James, for the information. Loon found that democratic leadership led to a friendlier atmosphere and better intermember relationships. Intermember means between members within the group. 
uh, learners are more satisfied when they're able to participate in group decisions according to Schmuck and Schmuck from 2001. Now here's, <coughs> this is brilliant. If you haven't heard of Bruce Tuckman, uh, maybe again, Alex, do you want to put that in the comments or someone? If you haven't heard of Bruce Tuckman, uh, we're going to have a think about what he said. This this is absolute gold dust. And I want, uh, even as I'm speaking, I want to relate this to, to my situation. And I really want you guys to relate this to your situation. Uh, Bruce Tuckman speaks about the stages of group formation. Uh, he, speak, he initially spoke about four stages of group dynamics. And then I think uh, later in his research or his ideas, he came up with one more. So we're going to look at these four stages of group um, of group dynamics. This is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I love it. And I want you to think about, uh, again, your experience in the classroom. And as we discuss these groups, can you can you think of a of a time when you were at maybe at stage one or stage three or or whatever. So here's uh, here's the four stages. Uh, Bruce Duckman, thank you, Alex. Authoritarian teachers often go against the main principles of learning. They don't allow us to ask questions and make mistakes. Yeah. I mean, learning shouldn't be. I think it was traditionally called chalk and talk. You know, the teacher stands here. Imagine this is a whiteboard and explains to you how to prove Pythagoras' theorem or how to do first conditionals, and you just like uh, you just sit and listen. And there's no, there's no engagement. There's no group interaction. They're very authoritative using autocracy, and that's not how. I, I don't think that's how a classroom should work at all. Um, you've you've got to ask questions. You've got to make mistakes. I mean. Growth mindset, that's something we've spoken about in this channel before. You've got to take your mistakes, learn from them, and, and you know, get better, get better at things. So yeah, these four stages that Bruce Tuckman came up with. Uh, forming, I'm going to put these in. Maybe you guys haven't heard this. So this is, they're kind of in order. Uh, forming, uh, storming, norming and performing does <laughs> does anybody have any idea what these mean the four stages of group dynamics this is applicable uh to the classroom to the business world maybe even i don't know to the family but that's slightly different anywhere where there's a team i think actually bruce tuckman came up with it when he was thinking about team building exercises but uh, in this video we're mostly going to think about it in relation to the classroom does anybody have any clue what these mean forming Storming, norming, and performing. This is absolute gold dust. <clears throat> Any ideas? I've got some notes. You know what the last one means? Okay, what does the last one mean, Alex, in relation to Group dynamics performing. So here's um, here's some ideas. And these are definitions again. Thank you to James for providing these on this course. At stage one, usually, is when a group forms. Obviously, As students are anxious and nervous and dependent on a teacher. They try out new methods and look for acceptable behaviour rules and norms. So I guess this is when a, when a class starts. Um, and this can last a long time. Maybe it could be a first lesson. And in the classroom, it could be five minutes. It could be a week. I mean, in my opinion, if you're a teacher and it's, it's lasting more than, I don't know, two, three hours, that's too long. That is too long. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys, what's the what's the best way to deal with this first stage of group dynamics of forming? What's the best way to deal with getting through this stage of forming group dynamics? And the suggestion in uh, Bruce Tuckman's theory is that the teacher would be at this stage more authoritarian, using more autocracy, uh, fully supervising the students' work, giving a sense of direction. 
Uh, then students come to know their specific roles and what the aim of a given task or a lesson is. Uh, students need to get to know each other personally to feel part of the group. Um, so was it was it Wild Cruiser or I think it was Wild Cruiser asked earlier about how to break the ice. <coughs> and that's that's something that's essential. But what Bruce Tugman is saying that if students or those members of a group don't get to know each other during the forming stage, then the teacher or the group leader is going to be hitting a, hitting a wall. You won't break through the difficulties of the forming stage unless people actually, actually get to know each other. Now, in my experience, uh, <clears throat> this was harder in the maths classroom in, in the UK. Uh, the saying that people had you know, maybe been in the same year for longer, so it was okay. But if, it, if they're just starting a new school and you're teaching a maths lesson, I find this much harder. So maybe you have to do an entire lesson of icebreaking, get to know each other and actually know maths or, or little maths. However, in an English language classroom, uh, one of the ways you get to know each other is by talking. And of course, if you're talking in a, in a language classroom, you're achieving something. So it was okay. We could kind of have an icebreak lesson, be an hour, an hour and a half. And that was okay. You're actually covering what you need to. But Tugman is definitely saying that no matter what the subject, biology, physics, art, music, tech, anything if you don't get to know people the other people in the group you're not going to get through the forming stage and yeah so that's it icebreakers anybody got any good suggestions for icebreakers let a uh, let each other know so that's the that's the forming stage when they start working together and produce results top level absolutely alex that is that's the last stage so second stage we have uh storming <clears throat> Any ideas what storming means? Do you think it's a positive, negative, or neutral? What uh, what does storming mean? <clears throat> How much does a polar bear bear away? Enough to break the ice. That's a that's a classic one. Hello, my name is insert your name here. That would work in a nice beginner, uh, beginner English language classroom. So stage two, uh, if you've just joined, we're, we're looking at Bruce Tuckman's four stages of group dynamics. Stage two is storming, uh, a bit angry. Students rebel against each other and the leader or the teacher in our situation. <coughs> they can't accept the norms and the rules or concentrate on a given task to fulfill it successfully. Yeah. So people have got to know each other and maybe they rebel, maybe there are some difficulties. Uh, now I've been in classrooms in the UK when I was teaching maths. I was the, the head of maths for three, four years. And I was in some classrooms where the, the whole year they formed in about two minutes and then they stormed for the entire year. So you know you had to give some support to the students, some support to the teacher, you had to get other people in school involved, some really difficult situations. And I wish I knew more about group dynamics, about how to get a class out of this storming situation. This is every teacher's worst nightmare, you know, classroom management, behavior management, discipline. <laughs> I'm sure you've all been in classes or situations where, where things have been storming. Um, here, here's a suggestion. So rather than being authoritarian, there's a suggestion that Bruce Tuckman is saying that maybe the leader or the teacher should be between authoritarian and democratic. You can't give students full control or uh, goodness knows what will happen in the classroom, but you can't maintain full control or else you will never get anywhere near the norming or the performing stage we'll think about. And this occurs when the leader or the teacher convinces the students of the importance of a task or a lesson and kind of reinforces the rules and how they go about it working together, whatever the rules are in your classroom or your, your team. And the students then become more aware of the learning process. Uh, a lot of classes, um, certainly the ones I had a few years ago when I was teaching maths, it would normally be two or three weeks. You go through storming, and then four months later, you might go through it again for a week, a week and a half, because there was difficult situations, you know, because of the weather, because of difficulties in family, because of exams coming up, you know, particularly difficult homework or task or something. But storming, you know, you want to keep it as short as possible. It's, you know, it can be sometimes quite exciting to get from forming to storming to the to the more positive stages. Um, you know, again, comment if you've ever 
uh, been in a class that you would have described the dynamics as storming and, and let us let us know something about that. <clears throat> yeah. So what exactly is storming, simply put? <laughs> Let's, I'll go to Tuckman and see what he says exactly. <clears throat> the team starts, this is about um, team building, Alex. The team starts to address the task, suggesting ideas. Different ideas may appeal for ascendancy, and if badly managed, this phase can be very destructive for the team. So it's kind of clashing and rebel. Relationship is between Start again. Relationships between team members will be made or broken in this phase, and some may never recover. In extreme cases, the team can become stuck in the storming phase, as I described, you know, lessons for a whole year. If a team is too focused on consensus, they may decide on a plan which is less effective in completing the task for the sake of the team. This carries its own set of problems. It is essential that a team has strong, facilitative leadership in this phase. So not autocracy, but somewhere between autocracy and democracy. Does that make sense? It's quite a difficult one. That's, I think, more, uh, what I've just read is more applicable to to team building rather than maybe a classroom, but, but the principles of group dynamics sort of go through. <clears throat> so stage three, let's have a look. Is there anyone else there? There's like two or three people commenting. Is there anyone else here? Are you people just listening? Norming. Any ideas what you think norming might mean? And again, it's like maybe the third time I've said now, share your experiences in the classroom, your positive experiences and your negative experiences. And we'll, we'll try and think, was this when a classroom was storming, norming, performing, or forming? They saw kind of sound somewhere. Please share your experiences. We'll come to norming in just a second. <clears throat> Good work together. Students help each other in order to reach their aim. Really important. Students help each other in order to reach their aim. They begin to accept the norms. That's like kind of the rules and they establish behaviors in the classroom or the team and their rules. Uh, the group does not get out of control. Students eagerly exchange their views. And here is a suggestion again from, from Tuckman, Bruce Tuckman, and from, from James Egerton about the style of the leader. Uh, and I agree with this. Democracy here, a democratic style of leadership, is really important. Uh, this style allows the students to share their ideas and cooperate with each other and with the teacher during the decision making process. The learners are encouraged to interact with each other and with the teacher. Uh, more cooperative students is what happens in this phase. And the, the, the responsibility for the progress, for whatever it is that's being completed, task, lesson, business meeting, whatever, uh, sell, if you're selling things, everyone's sort of involved together. Um, the leader, hopefully by this stage, has become, has become a facilitator. And other people have become you know, little leaders in the classroom too. Uh, there's no reason why a 12 year old in my English language classroom couldn't be a leader or an eight year old or a 17 year old or an adult. It doesn't, the only leader in a classroom should not just be the teacher. I mean, I'm passionate that teachers are leaders, teachers are teachers, teachers are leaders. But I think everybody in the classroom should be a teacher and everybody in the classroom should be a leader. You know, everybody a teacher, everybody a leader, and everybody a learner. That, that's another point. That's a bit of a rant. I won't go into it too much. If teachers aren't learning, uh, no, it's, it's not going to work because teachers are requiring their students to learn. And if they don't learn themselves, no, 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 that doesn't work. You should always be teaching. You should always be learning and you should always be leading. These are things you can develop, you know, from birth right up until the end of your life. It's uh, that's something I'm, I'm really passionate about. Again, share your experiences. That's norming. It's just things become kind of normal. Normal. Norming. Thanks, Alex. I feel the badly handled sportsmanship due to competitiveness makes groups stuck in storming. I don't see anyone else here. That's okay. 
Okay, stage four uh, is performing. So this, um, this was commented on slightly earlier. Uh, everyone contributes to class completion. All problems are resolved. Solutions are easily found. Members of the group concentrate on the interpersonal relationships. This is where you want to get to. Um, fantastic, fantastic place to be. Uh, absolutely brilliant. So folks, um, moving on, I would like people to share their own experiences. And um, I put out some questions on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Um, they're in the description. I can't remember exactly what they were, but I'll have a little look on Facebook. So the questions were, um, how important, I want you to answer these in the comments. How important is the personality of the teacher and the students? Uh, do you have or have you had any classrooms with positive or negative dynamics? And how can the dynamics in the classroom be improved? So I'd like to share uh, some of my own experiences, but mostly I'd like to hear what you guys have to say um, in the comments. This is a live stream. That's how it works. So I'll say it again. How important is the personality of the teacher and the students? Uh, do you have or have you had any classrooms with positive or negative dynamics? And how can the dynamics in the classroom be improved? Um, so I'd like to tell you about uh, some of my experiences, some as a teacher of maths, some as a teacher of English, and then some as a learner. Uh, and hopefully if I start sharing, then other people will share theirs. So I want to tell you about probably my favorite ever teacher. I might not mind saying his name. I still don't know his first name. A gentleman called Mr. Tregenna. Uh, he was a senior teacher, maybe 60 years old, uh, senior responsibility and age when I was at my in my school, Sullivan Grammar School, Sullivan Upper School in Belfast, or in Hollywood. Rory McElroy is from Hollywood, if anyone follows golf. He was in my school. And yeah, we have the, the Royal, we have the Open next week up in Northern Ireland for the first time in a long time. Fantastic. That's another story. So Mr. Jagana was my English teacher in my GCSE years, so like 14, 15. And the way in which he, <coughs> he built a positive rapport with the class was through humour. Uh, so we studied uh, Macbeth, the Shakespeare play, um, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. And I mean, we studied these books for like six months, nine months, and very, very long lessons. You know, it felt like every lesson was an English literature lesson, not an English language lesson. And man, Mr. Chigana could talk. But he talked in a very deep, soothing Northern Irish, very strong uh, accent, very easy to listen to. And he told stories... <laughs> in such a funny way, but a very, um, very dry humor. He would never laugh. We would all laugh a lot inside, but he was incredible. Um, so two stories I'll share about him were um, someone, I think a guy called Ryan in the class, this is going back, what, 17, 18 years ago. He asked Mr. Chigana to, ex to explain the difference between infer and imply. Someone put those in the comments. Infer and imply. And I think, I think Ryan just wanted to listen to Mr. Jagana. I mean, I kid you not, 30 minutes later, he was still, <laughs> you know, telling us anecdotes, anecdotes, telling us stories about the difference between infer and imply. Uh, and then after this, uh, someone else, it might've been Gordon, or it might've been me. It's probably me, but we'll forget that. Then asked him about split infinitives, you know, to boldly go where no man has go, stuff like that with Star Wars. And uh, that was the 30 minutes done. So in, infer and imply and split infinitives. It's ridiculous. Never teach them. Uh, <laughs> and one hour and he was done and he was so funny. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing, and this is my favorite ever quote from, uh, from school. I sat beside my uh, my friend uh, Justin, who did a PhD, is now Dr. Dr. Livingstone, <laughs> Queen's University of Belfast, lecturing in English. So I sat beside him, and obviously he was a bit more capable than me. And we often sort of whispered the whole time throughout uh, Mr. Chagana's you know lectures and anecdotes and stuff. 
And one time he said, um, kind of in a very deep, uh, sort of passive way, <clears throat> Mr. McCarty, because he never called me Alistair, always Mr. McCarty. Mr. McCarty, <clears throat> would you uh, would you like uh, would you like me to close the window, or is it keeping you awake? <laughs> and in this sentence, so would you like to would you like me to close the window, or is it keeping you awake, Mr. Degana? Fully understood, you know, just how much he spoke, and he was just su in such a lighthearted way. He was kind of laughing at himself, and I mean, the, the, I mean, the roars that went off in the class were incredible. We still talk about it. You know, four or five of my good friends are in that are in that class. They still live here. I see them, and what he picked up, what he sorry built up during you know these stories, these anecdotes, and this little quote, just incredible respect, because he knew he talked a lot. He knew he was a little boring. But he was just basically telling a bunch of 15 year olds his life experience. And, you know, we were, uh, you know, I was, the bottom line is I was, I absolutely love Macbeth and The Kill of Mockingbird. I read Kill Mockingbird seven times in two years. And that was my revision. He was telling all these stories and all this language analysis. And I was having a conversation, but kind of listening, picking up things. And the rapport he built through humor. So that, that's one way. Um, someone asked at the start, how do you, how do you break the ice? How do you, you know, I guess this whole video is about how to improve dynamics, and uh, you know, humor is one way. Absolutely, infer and employ. Every teacher and student should be a leader, teacher, and learner. That's me. Thanks, James Gold. <laughs> personality is very important. I agree, Alex. Often, people with no apparent personality often lose the class. Very many famous teachers are so eccentric; it keeps your attention on them at most times. Yeah, I think. Eccentricity, how do you say that, is really important. You can you can get people's attention. You can be a little bit different. Um, but yeah, that was Mr. Chigana. If you have any teachers you'd like to share, to share their story, how they, how they build a good rapport with the class or, unfortunately, a, a bad rapport, go ahead in the comments and, and share your experience. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share another one now. This is oh, wrong notes. Where am I? I'm going to, uh, this is my art teacher in, uh, in year nine. So I was maybe 13, 14. And art was my, uh, was a subject I wasn't very good at, to say the least. And my art teacher was a gentleman called Mr. McKillen. I had him in year seven as well. And then someone else in year eight, uh, Mr. McKillen again in year nine. And our project from September to Christmas was we had to take a shoe box. Uh, do you have a shoe box? No. I take a shoe box. And decorated it into a into uh, like a living space, a bedroom. This was about this size, and this lasted the whole September to December. So that was twelve weeks. That was our entire project, and we had our two hours a week. So you do the math. Uh, how long that was? Twenty-four hours. No, it was more than twelve weeks. Four, eight, twelve, thirteen, thirteen, fourteen. No, September, October, November, December. I don't know, whatever. Fifteen weeks. Two hours a week. Thirty hours, whatever. And uh, so I did nothing for the entire 30, um, 30 hours until uh, 30 minutes before the final lesson. I just talked to my friends and I was going to, I finished art at the end of year nine, uh, GCSEs were year 10, and I was going to do different subjects. I wasn't interested. Uh, 30 minutes into the final lesson, you know, like December the 17th or the 20th or something like that, I went to the bin and picked up some stuff that other people had thrown out. And... Uh, one of them was like wire mesh or something. And I sort of said that was it. That was like a sleeping bag. That's where the person would sleep. And then I colored it in. I got paint and sort of did some blue paint around it for about five minutes and then handed it in. And, you know, in theory, my theme was water because it was blue, you know, the sea. Uh, we had to have a theme and there had to be like some art. Um, we had to be, have receive our inspiration from some, I don't know, from some famous artist. <clears throat> So Mr. McKellen, of course, every every week he would sort of wander around and have a conversation. There was four of us at the table and the other three people at my table, you know, did their work. And he'd just have a child and I'd have a child kind of about art and just about life. He knew I wasn't doing anything. He didn't care. Um, he knew I wasn't going to continue art at GCSE um, every day. Um, I think at 9.30, half past nine, um, I put my hand up and said, excuse me, may I please go to the toilet? Uh, I never went to the toilet. I just walked around for 25 minutes until 9.55. And then there's only five minutes left. 
So we just sort of pack away because it's art. Not that I had anything to pack away. I wandered around the school for 25 minutes and it got to sort of November and uh, my school was very strict. I would just sort of give him a nod and he'd let me go. Again, this was humor, um, absolutely fantastic. So of course I sat down, handed in my product uh, project. He gave me 5%, two out of 40, yeah, 5%. And most people are getting, you know, 70, 80, 90%. And he basically said, Alistair, are you happy with this? And I said, yep. And he said, how much effort you, did you put in? And I said, none. And how do you feel about that? I don't care. And my parents don't care. Uh, and he said, you're, really a, you're on 5% in your art exam. That's, that's not very good. And I said, yep. And uh, that was two out of 40. I have my evaluation, which is therefore worth 60 marks, which is a write-up. Uh, I said, I've already started my evaluation. I have critiqued. Um, I picked another person in the class, a friend called Cara, whose artwork was incredible. And then I said, you know, if I had more time, I would have done this. And I compared my art to her art. And I, you know, talked about cubism and art deco and the history of art and things like this. And I got 57 out of 60 in my evaluation because I've done that so well. And he was obviously quite impressed. So I ended up getting 59% overall, which is okay. Um, I wasn't interested in making a, a shoebox. I didn't care. Um, I explained to him I didn't want to do it. What's the point? It's, uh, but I was interested in writing about art because art is fantastic. I just, you know, if you've seen my writing, I can hardly write my name. So my ability in art is not so good. Um, but Mr. McKellen, again, with humor, because uh, everyone kind of knew this in the class, that's how he built rapport. And I mean, my I was obviously passionate enough about art to write about it and do my individual research. I think I got the top mark, actually, in my evaluation. Um, in the whole year, but obviously the bottom mark in my practical work. So Mr. McKillen, uh, <laughs> this is how he, you know, I guess in a way got the class or got me to perform. I don't know. That's, a, that's another story from me. Withdrawal, Wild well, Cruiser, what do you mean? That applies to classes. Thank you. Change the doctors and quitting a cult charge. Improvement isn't something I can change by my own. I would make suggestions to a leader. But I, I'm not sure I agree, Wild Cruiser. Surely if you want to improve, the, your responsibility is on yourself. If I want to improve, that's on me, not other people. But do, do other people not feel like that? See, in Latvia, you get thrown out of school for stuff like that. What, not doing your art project, <laughs> Alex? Or, or something else I said. That's a, you know, that's, that's a fantastic story. I got a, had a strangely positive relationship with Mr. McKillen. Hmm. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask again, please. Uh, if you have a positive experience or a negative experience, the way I've been sharing, please, uh, please share with each other. And um, I have a negative one that I'm about to, to share. It was in my favorite subject, it was in geography, which I think most of you know is a subject I'm very passionate about. In fact, folks, I'm out of water, so I'm going to head downstairs, get some water. What I want when I'm away is get more people to come here and actually uh, comment uh, positive. Let's go positive. Comment one positive classroom experience you've had. I'll be back in two minutes.
Hello. I'm hoping to read something in the comments, your positive classroom experiences. Thanks, Alex, just you. <laughs> the previous physics teacher was very impressive. He didn't make any personal connections. I doubt he learned anyone's names and made stupid, ignorant, stereotypical remarks. Later, he just stopped coming to the lessons. That's not a good thing. If the teacher or the leader isn't there or students aren't there, they can't learn anything. And you wanted to study economics because my love for physics had died due to the teacher and I wanted money. First year economics, the economics teacher is kind of useless and our new physics teacher is brilliant. No, thanks for sharing, Alex. So basically what you're saying is the relationship between teacher and students is important. That's a, that makes such a difference. I mean, you, we can, people reading the comments can see your change from positivity to negativity and, and back again. That's, a, that's, that's how it works. Yes, I said I was going to share a, a negative experience. Um, this is my favorite subject, so this is possibly why it was a negative experience. And my geography teacher um, in year seven, eight, and nine in school, and um, fairly early on in the year, um, she already knew, as did the class, that I was, you know, a bit of a bit of an atlas geek. I got my first atlas when I was four. And I loved the facts and figures and maps and stuff like this. And she knew that I was passionate about this subject. And so we started talking about uh, the USA. And the conversation basically went, went along where she was saying there were 52 states in America. This was in 1998. And I, of course, was saying there are 50 states in America. And we got into a bit of an argument. And this was during a lesson because the lesson was about America. And she also said, you know, Alistair, please stop. We're teaching a lesson. And out of respect, because I was, you know, 12 or 13 years old and I was a little bit, a little bit frightened of her. Uh, and I respected her. I should do what adults say. I stopped arguing with her. But of course, went to see her at the end with my with my friend Roger, who also knew about geography. And he was a little bit. The teacher says it's fifty two. Al says it's fifty. Let's find out. So of course, I went had this conversation with her at the end of the lesson, and she maintained that there were fifty two. So of course, what I did was in about a minute, I stay. I, I said, I'll just tell you all of them. Uh, and of course, I started to say them all very quickly, and I know a way to say them quickly, alphabetical order, size order, reverse alphabetical order, order by population, and I knew all this. And of course, she shut me down, just like, stop, stop. And I was like, okay, but there are 50. And I said, you know, I can tell you the 50, and I would like you to tell me the extra 50, the extra two. And then I went on to explain, you know, some people think that Hawaii and Alaska, which were the two most recently to join the, the union, that takes up to 52. So I said, this is a common mistake people have. Um, no, these brought them from 48 to 50, and this is when they joined, this is their fly, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, no, 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 no. And I said, okay, it's okay. Um, I'll go and I'll write them all down and then show you the list tomorrow. And because uh, she was my form teacher, my, my class teacher as well. And uh, and then you can you can sort of discuss with me these extra two. And she was like, no, 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 don't do that. And of course, I was just like, okay, I can't argue with her. My geography teacher has lost respect. I've, sorry, I've lost the respect of my geography teacher. I still behaved well in class. It was my best subject. Um, but I, mean, I wasn't at the top of the class because I didn't, I didn't uh, you know, put in the effort. And lots of the work we had to do, basically it was whoever colored something in the most beautiful and all these wonderful diagrams. Of course, I didn't care. I wanted to look at geography from the point of view of how um, physical geography impacts human geography. So you take volcanoes, the study of volcanoes is physical geography. It's about the science. It's about our world. But then how that applies to humans. That was what I was interested in, the link between physical geography and human geography. Um, then when I came to year 11, 12, 13, uh, and 14, mm -hmm. 10, 11, 12, 13, sorry, uh, my GCSE is now level. I had a different teacher. Um, I won't go into it too much, but I had respect for him. <laughs> he actually wrote the course book for A-level geography in Northern Ireland. I think he's just recently retired, actually, uh, Mr. Tom. I had lots of respect for him, put in a little bit more effort. Obviously, the work got more interesting, and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to get the, the top the top award in, in my school in geography. And um, I was certainly nowhere near it in maths, and I didn't even do English at A-level. But I was inspired by him. Um, I still did well in, in junior school with her, but not as well. And I think this moment of you know lack of professional trust, because basically a, an 11, 12-year-old, had put her in her place about 
to me was a very simple fact about America. I lost a lot of respect for her uh, and just sort of went through the motions for three years. So that's that's a bit example of negative, um, you know, of a negative uh, situation in the classroom. And, you know, all these things we've spoken about, these four different stages of groups, I think in one of them, the teacher needs to be an expert in what they're doing. And maybe the teacher also needs to be an expert in forming groups. And in my case, the teacher needs to be an expert on the on the USA. Let's see, are you guys showing any of your experiences? Swap classes and studied physics. Yeah, I can understand. A good teacher is so important for students' progression and interest. So were you right or wrong? Of course I was right, Alex. For anybody who isn't aware, there are 50 states in America. I'll not list them all now. That'll be a little bit dull. But yeah, that um I guess that was a bit of a, a bit of a negative, uh, negative experience. Right, folks, I got a couple of comments on um, Instagram. I'm going to share. <clears throat> Some people have said things. Give me a second. So I put out the three questions. What were they? I'll just remind you. And please keep answering these. How important is the personality of the teacher and the students in a class? Uh, do you have or have you had any classrooms with positive or negative dynamics? Please share them in the comments. And how can the dynamics in the classroom be improved? Clearly, let me just find what people have said in the story. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Someone says it's what it depends on the, how the teacher looks physically. Um, don't think that's important. We'll leave that. Uh, Mango Hats, a... I think it's a 15-year-old guy from Norway. Uh, he says, yes, this is the first question. How important is personality? Uh, very, I had one teacher who made everyone interested and other teachers said they were envious of how well this person teaches the students. Uh, Mango Pats goes on to say it wasn't his technique, uh, just the way he spoke. And uh, you could hear that he was passionate about teaching and just everything about him captured, captured the entire classes of high school students in a way that Mango had seen no one else do. That's brilliant. So this uh, this guy is saying that just the way you speak, like passion comes through in how you speak, and maybe that's a good way to to certainly in the in the forming stage of groups. I think that's a good thing to do. You can show your passion. Maybe you can do that throughout all stages of a of group development. If the teacher isn't passionate, that you know why would the, why would the students be passionate? Uh, Felution. It uh, just says, yes, very, as in it's very important, but doesn't explain. Uh, this one, again, from Felician is in relation to how to make the classroom more positive and the dynamics. Actually, this is interesting. I've not thought about this, and maybe my art, artistic mind <laughs> doesn't understand this. Make it colored. Just make it a better space. Add more color to the space. Yeah, I've not thought of that. And then I've got a couple of responses about have the dynamics in your classroom been improved. Uh, a couple of people are saying that they find their classrooms are mostly negative. That's that's unfortunate. Um, so, yeah, that was just uh, just some stuff on on Instagram. I wouldn't hold myself for proving her wrong. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I understand. Now, what else have I got here? Yeah, I've got um, a few more stories to share. Um, do, do people here know what, I'm going to put it in the comments, do people here know what Ofsted is? I'm going to, I'm going to say something about Ofsted. If you know what it is, you definitely know what it is. <laughs> So Ofsted is a government department um, in the UK who regulates schools. They come and basically observe schools and assess assess what's going on. Um, so yeah, people hate them. And <laughs> uh, they give four grades, I think outstanding, good, satisfactory, and inadequate. Uh, one, two, three, four. And they assess you on you know, teaching and learning, um, safeguarding, um, management uh, and some other ones I, I don't remember but basically schools panic and go crazy and uh, they look at your results and the league tables and things like this people hate them 
Um, but it's life. Uh, it's good to have some form of regulation, but a lot of people reckon they don't. They don't do such a good job. Uh, there's no. There's clearly no one here from Ofsted listening, so I can say whatever I like. Um, anyway, so I'm going to share one thing. Um, this I think. Um, this oh, there's only two people here, <laughs> and one of them's probably me, and the other one is you, Alex. But that's fine. Uh, this is like the best thing, and I promise you that this is the best thing that anyone I think could ever say to a teacher. Um, and thankfully it happened to me uh, during an offset observation and uh, I'm proud of my students I'll put it that way I'm proud of my students uh, it was first class it was a year 9 class so they were 13, 14 top set there's only like 22 of them we called it like a super set and offset came in for about 30 minutes uh, they came in with the uh, acting principal at the time a gentleman called Mr Ward obviously I was under a little bit of pressure um, did you sort of get the talk grade or whatever you want to call it? And the class were great, um, as they as they always were to their credit. And the Ofsted inspector you know, gave, me, gave me a good mark and all the rest of it. But he said, uh, it's as if you weren't there. You didn't need to be there. And I was just like, yep, that's how good my students are. We've got them to performing. They're all willing to learn. They're wanting to be involved in things. They're helping each other. They're answering questions. They're asking questions. They're making progress. Basically, I put, I think, eight problems on the board of varying difficulty and basically just went, go. And they did the questions. And then the, I think one or two of the questions had led on to what the topic of that lesson was. Uh, and I just basically said, go. And away they went. And people would get up. Uh, from their seat and go to sit beside another person who they knew was good at this topic and then come back and help each other. And uh, th this was during the lesson. The inspector just said, you don't need to be here. And I'm like, yep, that's right. Um, so, if, I mean, if you're a student listening, that's what you want in your classroom. If you're a teacher listening or if you're listening on the live replay, that's what you want. Someone to objectively look at your team and say, you don't need to be here. That means you've got everybody, um, everyone's a teacher, everyone's a learner, everyone's a leader. Um, my class are incredible. Um, and of course, thankfully, one of the good things about Ofsted, and this is one of the only good things, is they, they, ask, they, ask, the, they ask the students, or the, the teaching assistant, is it normally like this? And of course, my class said, yeah, it's normally like this. We all just help each other and get on with it. And I'm like, yep, that's the, I mean, it reflects well on me, but not really. It reflected well on the students. Um, and the school, I still would probably remember most of those, most of the students. And it took, I had them, uh, was it my second year? It was my second year of having them. I think Ofsted came in, I don't remember, January or February or something. And so I'd had them for, you know, what, 12 months. So I knew them well. And we'd got to the, we'd got to the performing stage. And thankfully the performing stage was quite long. I mean, the guys were talented, the guys and girls were talented at maths. But more importantly, they were teachers, leaders and learners. And they reached this together, and that was that was absolutely fantastic. That's good. I'm really I'm pleased to hear that, Alex. That you have this experience too. We've got six people. Thank you. A few more people have showed up. Wild cruiser. <clears throat> uh, my positive experience. I grew up in Catholic school, so I got a Catholic soul. Otherwise, most classes carrying goal to accomplish. And most need to compromise when compromises occur can't be fun. <laughs> the Dunder idiot. Hmm, that's a good question. What do you think? I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this. I'm also going to put it out here uh, for whoever else is listening. Uh, this uh, this is coming from the UK, but answered from your your country as well. What do you think the government can do to stop good teachers quitting? Almost everyone I know that went into teaching left at the PGCE or slightly later. A good question, the Dunder, and, and good name, the Dunder also. Uh, there's a few things. Uh, firstly, the thing not to do is just to throw money at teaching. Um, people, people are influenced by money, but in my experience, what people want uh, is to, to be able to make a difference, to be able to influence other people. That's what teachers want. Teachers. If you're teaching, you're not in it to make money. And if you're in it to make money, get out. Teachers need to be passionate. Teachers need to be teachers, leaders, and learners. So throwing money, 
sorry, government, I would love it if someone from the government is listening, because there are all these ideas, oh, we'll put all this money into getting new teachers. Don't do it, it will make no impact. No impact. Teachers are teachers because they're passionate about teaching. And you can see I'm passionate speaking like this. They want to make a difference. They want to be able to improve the country I'm speaking in, the quality of life in the UK. There are so many people who get through education, get through university, and they don't have, for example, basic skills in maths or English. And then they go and work, and you know the 40, 50-year-olds are like, what? You can't find a percentage, and you're working for an accountancy company. What? You don't even know how to do it in a spreadsheet. I mean, come on, you, you need to calculate it. It's, it's ridiculous. And I think teach, teachers um, throwing money at the profession is not a way to fix it. Um, I think the biggest way to fix it, and this comes across the whole country, is that right from old people in the country down to children, education needs to be valued. So I can only really share my experience with Latvia. Latvia is not perfect, but generally speaking, education is valued in Latvia. Now, lots of the reasons it's valued in Latvia is because unfortunately a lot of the young people in Latvia would like to leave Latvia and go to Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, you know, for a better life. So education is generally valued by the students and by parents. In my country, unfortunately, by lots of people, education is not valued. If someone says you're a teacher, it's like, well, okay. Whereas in Latvia, you're a teacher, that, that's an important um, career. Uh, the salary doesn't reflect it, but I think the biggest difference, the donder, is that, is that um, you need to have education valued. Um, second thing I'll say, the donder, <coughs> is that all the paperwork and administration and jumping through hoops needs to go. Teachers don't want to be filling in data about students. Teachers don't want to be teaching students to jump through hoops to pass exams. Teachers want to teach students. Teachers want students to be leaders. That's what we thought about earlier in this video, uh, group dynamics. You know, every, every teacher and every student should be a teacher, a leader, and a learner. I think that's the theme of this video. I might change the title when the video has gone live. Uh, so all this administration needs to go. Um, that'll be the second thing I'll say. Anybody else have any ideas? Or Alex, you've got one here. Dump money into the field, of course it will work. It doesn't work. Um, so uh, I could find an article, I don't have it saved, but uh, basically our government gave um, bursaries, I think they're called, to, um, to teachers, Alex. They basically said, we'll give you five, seven, nine thousand pounds uh, just to train to be a teacher. You still have to pay university fees and stuff. And then when you have finished, uh, your first year will give you five thousand pounds called the golden handshake tax-free and then there are other incentives as well uh, financial incentives and as the donder is saying just up above um, people still leave not long after the PGC and I mean a teacher a teacher salary in the UK to start with is a is a very respectable salary 23 24 thousand a year to start with you get a good pension scheme and if you're getting this bursary a golden handshake I mean you're, you're raking it in you could be 21, 22 years old. And then there's a nice little growth, uh, 2%. And you can, uh, you go up each year. Uh, it's, you know, you're not going to make millions, but there's enough money uh, to encourage people to get into it in the UK. And it doesn't encourage people to stay. Um, people teach not for money. People teach because they're passionate about it. The government aren't qualified. Of course, the government don't know how to teach. Absolutely. Many teachers in the last year are actually quitting due to the lack of money. Yeah. Uh, BSHR, hello everybody. Hey, how are you? Thanks for joining the stream. Wild Cruisers, thanks for sharing your experience with Catholic School. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I shared with you about my, my experience with Ofsted. Um, I'll say that again if you didn't hear it. They said about my class, uh, top set, super set, math class, that it's as if I wasn't there. I didn't need to be there. That's how I that's how much this group was performing. They got through the forming stage, the storming stage, which to be fair, they were never in with me, the norming stage, and they were performing. I didn't need to be there. They were all teachers, leaders, and learners themselves. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm gonna share a couple of other uh, comments. These were internal comments. Give me a second. 
So this was a this was a class. This is about my class. This was an internal um, observation uh, from my principal at the time, and he said about the students. Uh, pupils are well established in trying to work it out for themselves. This was about maths, um, with the teacher prompting. I think this these children were in year six, so they were maybe 10 years old, 10, 11 years old, so a little bit younger. With the teacher prompting when necessary, ET first poke. So you would, uh, at this age, I think it's very difficult to expect, uh, it would have been very difficult to expect learners you know, to do everything themselves. They're still quite young children. So you sort of poke them in the right direction. Uh, this has the effect of enhancing resilience, confidence, and problem-solving skills. A positive and supportive atmosphere encourages pupils to tackle difficult questions. Yeah. Growth mindset comes into that as well. Uh, okay, some more things I'd just like to share. <laughs> this is brilliant. Uh, this was a this was a year nine class set to. Um, I'll share some of these comments. Uh, pupils are encouraged to talk to each other about maths, and all were engaged from the outset. Um, there's lots of stuff about about group theory, about you know classroom management. That it's all about how you start. Uh, you set a precedence for how you begin something and how it continues. <laughs> so for me, in an, in an English language classroom, it's obvious. In a French language classroom, in a German language classroom, in a Russian language classroom, in a Latvian language classroom, it's obvious you've got to speak. But uh, this observer was saying pupils are encouraged to talk to each other about maths. People should be talking about biology. People should be talking about art. People should be talking about tech, about sport. And you should be speaking and listening as well as doing. I think there's theory for that. That helps you learn. Uh, routines are clearly well established and pupils are comfortable and confident working together. That's another thing that really helps group dynamics and improves your classroom. Routines. Um, a teacher of mine from, uh, from Latvia, Sally, uh, she was our young learner expert. She normally have the very young learners, uh, you know, three, four, five, six years old. And she said that basically routines were essential. You start at the same time, you say hello at the same time, you do this song, you have this little puppet. The way in which you do activities and the way you give instructions has to be the same. So they can follow these routines and they can accept them and they can start to you know, feel part of the group and feel part of the, uh, you know, what's going on with the routines. And back to this commentary, <clears throat> you tease out, that's where you bring something out, you facilitate in the English language learning classrooms, we use the word elicit. You elicit prior knowledge, what people knew in the past, through random questioning, challenging individual responses as appropriate. Um, I don't know what experience uh, you have in the classroom, whether you're a teacher or a learner. Do Did your teacher uh, want people to put their hand up to answer questions, <clears throat> or did the teacher ask randomly? Let me, let me know in the comments. Did your teacher ask randomly or take hands? So in my experience, randomly asking questions is one of the best ways to improve group dynamics and one of the simplest way to improve your classroom. Because if you're asking questions randomly, that means everybody needs to be listening and engaged the whole lesson because you, you don't know when you might be asked. Because sometimes, you know, a teacher asks a question, uh, what tense is used in this question? Samir, and Samir answers. And everyone else is like, uh, not listening. Sometimes the teacher uh, doesn't give people time to think. So I think it's really important. This is, the, for me, this is the simplest way that any classroom can be improved. I've always said this to my colleagues. Ask a question and then, without being rude, shut your mouth. And then randomly pick a student. Because then in that, you've asked a question and in my classroom, all 10 students have answered the question in their head. And that means everyone is using their brain rather than asking, Samir, what's the past tense? And no one else is listening because no one listens when you say someone else's name. You know, that's how groups work. You should ask a question, shut your mouth, and then randomly select someone. Now, alongside this, there needs to be a supportive, <clears throat> there needs to be a supportive mechanism because you might get asked difficult questions. And, you don't want to frighten pupils so that they get nervous and things like this, particularly younger pupils. But, you know, I don't know is a brilliant answer. Uh, or, you know, 
an incorrect answer is fine. It's how, it's how the teacher and how the group together use it. So that's absolutely fine. Um, <clears throat> this is a random questioning, allows you to assess their level of understanding, random quest, uh, questioning, and adapt your questions accordingly. Uh, pupils are able to, and that's not relevant. The learning objectives are clear, leveled, and shared. Yeah, I mean, any classroom, any group, Think of a business meeting, for example, there has to be an objective. And there has to maybe objectives are different for different people. You know, the CEO of a company will have a different objective to, uh, to the HR advisor. And people need to know what, the, what their role is in a meeting. Uh, this is brilliant. All pupils know what they need to do to improve. Um, you know, take equations, for example. By the way, my next video on Monday is going to be on maths. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. There's lots of different types of equations, linear equations, linear equations of fractions, quadratic equations, simultaneous equations, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and different students would need different, different levels of challenge. Again, in English, it's very obvious. <laughs> take a grammar point, there's lots of different levels. Just take the tenses, some are very simple and some are more complicated. People need to know exactly what, what they need to do to improve. And a good leader will share that. And Leaders in the classroom will, will know what they need to do to improve. <clears throat> hmm. What's your review on private education? Thank you, the Dunder. So the Dunder, why is your name the Dunder? <laughs> um, is it elitist and dividing society or an option required due to falling educational standards? Alex, that's an amazing question. Let's, I, I'm going to read out um, your response, Alex, first. Education in Latvia still has some Soviet tendencies, of course. It wasn't that long ago. Everything is based around strict order, authority, and no freedom. You get punished for thinking outside the box, as you've shared with me on many occasions. It does put you on edge. People do ask questions randomly, but often unconsciously biased towards people with declining performance. That's true. That's true. That's why I said random. Um, yeah. Let's, there's five people here. Well, put, I'm going to put the question out to people watching. What, what's your view on private education? Um, I'll share my view about the UK. Uh, I know we've got people from Latvia, I think someone from, from uh, New York City. How is it in your country, private education versus public education? Um, and what's my view on it? Um, I mean, the Dunder, I saw a... I think it was a post on social media about uh, which universities and which schools uh, was it the 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 candidates for for the new prime minister of the UK had come from and the previous ones and they'd all gone to the same school or similar they're all gone to private schools and they'd all gone to Oxford I think is it elitist yes are as you put are there falling educational standards yes but is private education suitable for everyone? No. Uh, I just think there are, I think there are ways that my country and other countries too can, can improve education without private education. It, it has some place because you know, some people are always going to use it, you know, the very wealthy and the elite. Um, but I think for most people, public education should be good enough. I, mean, I know in Finland, for example, and we'll go on about it too much, Everyone just goes to this, this the local state school. <clears throat> They're all, in theory, equal. Uh, and I don't know if that's legitimate. I only have maybe one or two Finnish friends, and they would sort of support this. <clears throat> There's a long way to go to get the UK like this, but education isn't valued enough. And it starts maybe from the government. It starts in the home. Um, I'm very fortunate that, that my mother and father, uh, with the, the four of us, when I was the youngest, that they put a huge um, value on education. Not in a, you must get the top marks, but just that this gives you opportunities in life. <clears throat> it's really important. You'll find friends. Um, school is the best time of your life. That's how, <clears throat> excuse me. That's how my mother, <clears throat> my voice is going a little bit, I'm gonna lower the tone a bit. That's how my mother, and father valued education that had a big impact on me and that's probably part of the reason um you know why i'm a teacher uh i mean if you, 
I've been going for an hour and 25 minutes and anybody who's been listening will hopefully confirm that I'm passionate about teaching. Um, there's not a whole lot of people there. That doesn't matter to me. Uh, my message is really important. You know, I think I started the video with, I'm Alistair and I'm passionate about teaching. And that's the truth. Uh, and I, I really think that uh, that's where you got to start. So, hey, government, watch this video and become more passionate about education. Um, because if you think about it, um, everyone needs to be taught. Our future doctors, lawyers, cleaners, plumbers, politicians, no matter what you do, everyone needs to be taught. So if you, as a government, as a family, as a society, if you put more emphasis on education, and I think the public education system, that's how you improve it. But hey, who listens to me? Thanks, Mark. Sorry, thanks, the Dunder. Estonia, Lithuania, and Poland seem to recover better. Yeah, I mean, international schools, though, in, in, in Riga are really expensive. Yeah, several thousand euro a month. No, that's not, that's not, a, normal, that's not a normal salary in, uh, in Latvia. Yeah, it's easier to buy marks, yeah. I don't know, Mark. marks are like really important. I don't know the Dunder, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I'd like to, there are other people here, I think. I'd like to know what you, what your opinion on private education is. Good, bad, elitist, what about it? Is, is it the only way to improve things? Wild Cruiser, thank you for chipping in, love it. it means you are a good person. It means you're a good person wannabe. Nice way of putting it. I went to a subsidized Catholic school, so right in the middle, 50% good. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's you know, a moderation would be the word I would use for that. That's nice. I'm going to get back to uh, to some of the comments that someone made about a, a year nine class I had. I was I was quite enjoying that. Keep uh, please keep commenting. I'm still I'd still like to have more participation about uh, about your experience. I'm going to go just remind you of the the three questions that I'm thinking about. Um, <clears throat> how important is the personality of the teacher and the students? Like what about the student dynamics? I haven't really thought about that. Um, have you had any positive or negative? Um, experiences in the classroom, classroom dynamics, and how can we improve the dynamics in the classroom? I think I've given a few, a few tips uh, for breaking the ice, for improving dynamics, for getting to stage four, the performing stage. I'd like to know what people listening have to say on that. <clears throat> yeah, I remember Alex, you shared this before about uh, Oxford not accepting Latvia. That's ridiculous. That's elitist. I'm not okay with that. It is a need to study in private schools to earn other qualifications. That's not okay. That is elitist. And ultimately, these people who are in government, because let's face it, most of the government in my country went to private schools, went to uh, went to Oxford or places like this. And are they helping the education system? No, because they don't understand. You know, what, what proportion of the UK goes to private schools? Not a lot. What proportion of Latvia? What proportion of countries go to private schools? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, let's get back to some of these notes. This is this is this is gold dust. Uh, this is about it's kind of democracy. Uh, going back to what we said, I don't know, a few minutes ago. Uh, a teacher can be autocratic, makes some decisions themselves. Do this, do this, do this. No student, uh, no team member involvement. Or they can be democratic. You know, give the students choice. Give the people choice who they vote for. And this is the feedback I was given. Pupils are given choice of how they work. Love it. A challenge and differentiation are built into these tasks. Uh, differentiation basically means uh, different um, interests, different skills, different levels work differently. Uh, pupils talk confidently about the progress they have made in maths over time and can give specific examples to demonstrate this. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I think it's more important that you've made progress rather than, rather than you say you've made progress. Let's, let's go to the English classroom. I now understand the second conditional. Great, but can you show it? I think it's more important that they've made the progress rather than that they have said they have made the progress. But if you're not progressing, if you're not developing, that is not a successful classroom. So teachers, if you're listening, students, if you're listening, make sure that there's a goal in mind. 
why are you learning English? Why are you learning French? Why are you learning maths? Why are you learning the guitar? What's the point? There's got to be progress. And you got to um, you know, assess yourself in line with it. This is nice. There is a buzz about the room. How do you create buzz in a classroom? Sh share your experiences. How do you create buzz in a classroom? Have you been uh, in a classroom, in an environment, in a team where there has been a buzz? Or where there hasn't been a buzz? How do we, how do we have buzz in the classroom? Lovely word here. You're able to facilitate, support, and intervene as necessary. Because all pupils are talking through and showing their understanding, allowing you to address misconceptions. Um, maybe, Alex, you could type misconceptions in the comments or someone. Uh, so a concept is an idea. A misconception. So if a student has a misconception, it means they don't understand the idea. So, for example, um, I'll go maths. Uh, if you, let's get a good example. If you're teaching maths, I think the, the best way to do that, and maybe it's the same for languages as well, is rather than just say, this is how you do it, the, the best way is to understand why the person can't do it, what misconception they have in here, and then try and break down those barriers to help them to understand it. Um, so something that I find with algebra, I'm going to talk about this on Monday, is an equation. Most students, I find, don't actually know what an equation is. They've just been taught or told, not taught, they've just been told by their teacher, blah, 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 blah. this is how you solve an equation, this is called a da, 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 and this is what you do. You just do this. Why do we do it? You just do it. And they don't actually understand the concept of what an equation is. An equation is something that has a solution. Whereas an expression or an inequality or I don't know, an identity is completely different. Don't want to go into too much maths, <laughs> but that's really important for teaching that you know you, the people understand and you break down their misconceptions. Throughout the lesson, all pupils are motivated and engaged. That's got to happen in any successful classroom. But how do you do that? They're resilient, means they can break through barriers and want to succeed, and confident and are keen to move on. But they work hard together in pairs, sharing responsibility evenly. Um, that's, that's another tip I will give you. Uh, any classroom, as much as possible, get people to work with others. It's a team, right? That can be in pairs, it could be in threes, it can be in a larger group. Uh, but I like pair work. So I would often, uh, uh, in the language classroom in Riga, I would go up students to, to work together or at least to do an exercise, you know, something dull, an exercise, they have to do it, and then check, check their answers together and to discuss them and to both take responsibility, as in if something is right, both people got it right. If something isn't right, both people got it wrong. It's, a, it's such a simple tip. Or again, in the language classroom, there's a question on the board. Let's say we were looking at uh, past simple with 11 year olds and says on the board, what did you do yesterday? And you go two, 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 talk for 30 seconds. You ask and you answer. It's great. Rather than going, the teacher goes, what did you do yesterday? I played football. What did you do? I ate breakfast. You know, and there'd be mistakes, of course. But getting people to work in pairs, um, like n not all the time, but nearly all the time, people should be working with others. It's extra in a language classroom, not just for English. It increases the amount of speaking. It increases the amount of listening. Pair work is absolute gold dust. Drama. Uh, sorry, Wild Cruiser, I don't understand. What do I mean by drama? Make ambiguous jokes. Ambiguous jokes get people's attention, absolutely. Male physics professors seem to be good at it. Yeah, male physics pr professors are probably a little bit crazy, but in a positive way. Drama. Hmm. Nice. What else has this person got to say? This, this is it. Um, please tell me if this has happened in your classroom. Let me know if this has happened in your classroom. Uh, there are several examples. Several is like four, five, six. Several examples of pupils teaching each other a natural evolution from paired 
discussion. Now this uh, comments from this observer uh, don't explain how that happened. But if you're in any team, you're in any group, any classroom, and this is happening, you have hit the holy grail. There are several examples of pupils teaching each other a natural evolution from pair discussion. So please, everyone listening to this, I don't know, is there anyone here, <laughs> uh, has been in a classroom or is still in a classroom, get yourself there. You should be teaching each other. You should be learning from each other and make sure your teacher's doing that. I mean, if your teacher isn't, tell them. You read this to them. There are seven, I don't know, type it down, whatever, it's brilliant. There are several examples of pupils teaching each other a natural evolution from pair discussion. I remember a, a student of mine, fantastic student, uh, Ignati, um, a Russian name, my school in Latvia, and he, he didn't enjoy this. Uh, I think for revision, I had uh, individual students for maybe for five minutes teach either one grammar point or one vocabulary point, just to revise as many topics as possible before the exam. And they would sort of come to the front and get the students to do things. But it's all about the students doing things, not the teacher. And Ignati sort of sent me an email and said he didn't really want to do it. I was like, why not? He said, I don't feel comfortable. I'm not the teacher. And I respect that because he was like 13, 14 years old. Um, and I said to him, that's OK. I won't make you do this again, Ignati, because you know I'm the teacher. However, I would expect you to do this in a group of two or three. Uh, and he was OK with that. And I sort of said to him, like, Ignati, you do this all the time. You check your answers and you explain to, to um, Dash uh, or who else did he work with, or Anna or Vitaly, Vladislav, whoever else he was sitting next to, he would explain things to them. So he was kind of being a teacher. But when I said to him in, in a more official way, he wasn't comfortable with it. But I tried to point out, look, Ignati, you're doing this anyway, and you do it really well. He was one of the stronger students in the group. And certainly from a vocab point of view, his vocab was the best in the group. He was interested in science and tech. So he had some very sophisticated, high-level vocab. And he'd often teach people and do a translation into Russian and they're laughing. And fantastic. So he was a little teacher. But when you said, you know, come to the front or stand up and teach people, I don't know, the present perfect continuous, he'd be like, no. But yeah, that's what you want. It does this happen in your classrooms where te pupils teach each other. Is it a natural evolution? Hmm. A great climate, isn't, isn't this nice? A great climate for learning and a positive atmosphere for deepening understanding has been created. Pupils apply their skills and a willingness to have a go are well established norms. Yeah, stage three. Just to remind you, we had forming, what was second, storming, norming, and performing. And this, this class had got to the norming stage where having a go. Uh, I think in my first couple of months um, in, in Riga and Latvia, I had some problems with students having a go. And Alex would refer to it. There's still some Soviet style, very traditional, do this, do this, do this. And it took me a while to get students to realize, you just have a go. Um, I've asked you a question. Uh, or I've asked you to speak to your partner. Just answer the question. You might, your language isn't perfect. You know, this is maybe ten years old. Students who were ten years old have a go, because once you have a go, your partner can correct you. You get more used to speaking English, and then maybe I could correct on the board and things like this. So having a go is is definitely something that everyone in the classroom, not just the teacher, not just the leader, should be should be establishing. A great lesson where pupils thrive. This is nice. Uh, they are curious. Uh, <clears throat> somehow the teacher, the leader, and the other students have to create curiosity. That's where you wonder what's happening. It's a fantastic thing. And happy to challenge themselves from the onset, the beginning. The freedom, that's very important in the classroom for group dynamics, the freedom to discuss ideas and possibilities to solve each problem motivates individuals and subtle, small, kind of hidden, Opportunities are there for all to learn from mistakes and understand the process of solving the problem, solving the problem, ultimately leading to success, leading ultimately to success. Fantastic. Yeah, Alex, thanks. When doing physics and maths, no one usually comes to the front of the class to talk, but when we're working on problems, we communicate and the smarter lads always explain concepts. So that's brilliant. Uh, 
that that should be happening. Uh, and you, you might find that uh, I'm sure you find that some people are better at different things than others, and you can sort of help each other. It's not a case of this person is smart and they will tell me everything. It's there's, there's got to be an element of teamwork, I think, for everything. Right, folks, we have been going for 1 hour 40. Um, I think I have about 20 minutes left in me. My voice is, my voice is going. Um, thank you for the couple of good questions we've had. Um, it's, it's nice at the end to have, uh, I've put a lot of questions out there to have more questions in the comments. Uh, please put, uh, put some questions in the comments, just, just something to show you. And there might be a prize. I don't know if people have seen this, my watch. Uh, it's not, the video is not sponsored, don't worry. Okay, it's not very, I don't know if you, you probably can't see it because the quality is not very good, but yeah, this is just, you know, this is my, uh, this is my country or part of it, Northern Ireland. This bit of uh, blue here is Loch Ness, which is the largest lake in Western Europe. Now there is a mistake, um, a spelling mistake in this, and of course as an English teacher I find it, um, that you obviously can't see, but the uh, it's, it's a place called Tandrugi, which is where potato crisps are made in Northern Ireland. It was spelled incorrectly. But yeah, before I, I'm not away. Before I went to live in Latvia, a good, uh, good friend of mine bought me this, just so I never, when I was teaching or when I was doing anything, I wouldn't forget where I came from. Um, so I'm wearing, I don't normally wear it during the day when I'm in the house, but I'm on live stream and it's kind of a cool watch. Uh, there's only one teacher and they have their way of understanding a concept. There are usually several smart lads. Yeah, that's it. The several smart lads, Alex, and the teacher, I think, should should work together. Yeah. So I got one more thing I'm going to share. <clears throat> uh, one more class of mine that was a positive experience. Uh, in the comments, just as we sort of finish things up, please any um, any questions you have, uh, type them away. Also, get yourself into the description, and there's a blog. It's not my blog; it's James's blog. Go and check it out. He said some incredible things about um, classroom dynamics and how to improve your classroom. Also, I mean, share this video with is there anyone you know who's in a classroom. Um, I think there's been a lot of stuff, actually. Um, not a lot of people have been watching, but that's fine. I think there's been a lot of good stuff said to improve classroom dynamics. Um, I think this video will help, would help teachers and can also help learners. And there's been some brilliant comments as well. So you know, please feel free to, to share this. Might be a bit weird watching it. Not live, but but that's okay. Um, I think there's been some good stuff. So any questions, please. Got some good questions. Any more questions, I'll, I'll take them and I'll share. <clears throat> I have one more thing to say to people. You remember that watch? It's, uh, it's three, three and uh, just over three years now, Alex. It's done me well. See, I want to share um, uh, an experience and I want to know your opinion on this. I had a class of 36 students. Um, I think I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, but a class of 36 students, absolutely brilliant. Uh, I think the students, they were 13, 14, so year nine, third year, secondary school. Um, maybe one of the best classes I've had. Um, I think they're now 18 or 19 now. <laughs> this is maths in England. And uh, this was set two. And the reason why there was 36 is because in the first class, the set one, they were kind of the kids who were, the students who were best at maths, there's only like 25. Then set three and four were kind of normal size, you know, 20 to 29, 30. And set five, which I also taught, there's like seven or eight students. So rather than have it sort of even, uh, I wanted us very small the bottom set. There were, you know, there were family problems and behavior problems and educational difficulties. I wanted to teach them. Uh, I wanted a small superset. And then most of the people in set two, a lot of people in set two who could have been in set one didn't want to be in the superset. They preferred to be in a much bigger class and hide and live in a safe environment. So I specifically chose a class with 36 students. And then set three and four were kind of average students, which uh, two other colleagues had. So I had two and five. Uh, and then one was a different teacher, three was a different teacher, and four was a different teacher. So there were four, four of us, and I had two of them year nine. Unbelievable class. Now, 
the loudest class in the school. Um, the, all the students said that. Any teacher who came in to watch him was just like, this is crazy. With so many students, but they were just like, ah! You would give them a problem and be like, uh, like you give them six questions. Before you give them the six questions, there was chaos because they're all like shouting at each other and turning around and helping each other, you know, talking about, you know, the football match and their, uh, their fixture after school and stuff, but also doing their work. And there's just chaos, like people going and sitting in different seats because, oh, I remember this student knows this and I forget this and I didn't do my homework and the absolute chaos. But the amount of work that got done was incredible. Like basically once I opened my mouth to start speaking, they would start speaking and you couldn't explain anything. It was just a case of they wanted to do things. They wanted to do things and they wanted to learn from each other. I have no idea how it happened. It might have been the previous teachers, but I mean, those lessons, 60 minute lesson, and we spoke for 30 seconds. Now I would wander around and help students because they put their hand up when they were doing exercises, but they wanted to teach each other. They didn't want to listen to me explain anything. They wanted to do questions. They wanted to learn by doing, or you, know, you could give them something and they'd read the explanation. They didn't want to listen to you. They wanted to do and they wanted to do together incredible class. They were performing and kind of between storming and no norming between storming and, and performing, but it was incredibly positive chaos. <clears throat> Who should I bet on in Silverstone? I don't know. I haven't really followed the last couple of races, Alex. And what I would say is big Federer fan, as, as people know, <clears throat> it's the Wimbledon semifinals tomorrow. I think I think Nadal might beat Fed and then Djokovic. I'd be very surprised if Djokovic didn't beat Bautista Agu. Not that anybody cares um, tomorrow. Though Bautista Agu did beat Djokovic the last twice, the last two times they played. I think it was in clay and in hard court earlier this year. But this is a grand slam. I expect it to be Djokovic and Nadal. I want to be Djokovic Federer. I think it'll be Djokovic and Nadal, which is crazy. Why are these guys still winning the grand slams? 36 is usually way too many people, Alex, but, uh, but what can you do? Um, <clears throat> folks, I'm going to put, oh, there's stuff I haven't seen. Oh, I, had, uh, I got one more thing. Well, wow. uh, this is from James. I'm going to put this link. It's in the description, but I really need to put it in the comments here. Nadal versus Roger is El Clasico, absolutely. But actually, Djokovic and Nadal have played more. Federer hasn't won a Grand Slam for a, since 2018 Australian Open. Nadal won the French. Djokovic won the three before that. I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be Nadal, Djokovic, Alex. Unfortunately, yeah. So have a look at this. Put another. Put another link here in the comments. This is about Tuckman's theory. It's gold dust. But yeah, I didn't. I didn't say some of this stuff for, uh, from James. This is why group dynamics are important. I'm just going to read. In short, <clears throat> human beings are group beings. Most of us grow up in groups. We call them families, working groups, companies or schools in my case, playing groups, teams, sport, and live in groups, communities, villages, suburbs, whatever. It's no coincidence that solitary, that means by yourself, confinement is the worst punishment in prison. If you want to know about that, watch The Shawshank Redemption. Uh, also, if you're learning English, watching English in movies is incredible. We form a sense of self <clears throat> from our interaction with others. It what makes it's what makes us human. James goes on to say it's strange then that developing a class's group dynamics is an underexplored feature of teacher training, and that research into the importance of the group in the learning process isn't filtering down into the classroom. Hadfield calls successful group dynamics a vital ingredient, ingredient something you cook with. But this is not cooking. Okay, cooking in a classroom, a vital ingredient to the teaching learning process as a cohesive group supports and motivates itself to get the best out of all its members. That this is gold dust. Teacher shouldn't be focused on the teacher. Teacher shouldn't be focused on one student. It's about getting the best out of everyone. Please, if you're a teacher, do that. And if you're not a teacher, go and tell your teacher that it's about getting the best out of everyone. <clears throat> Rossi hasn't won a race since June 2017, so Roger's doing fine. Okay. James then asks, what can a teacher do? <coughs> and some of this we spoke about. A teacher forming a successful group should not see their role as a sage on the stage, but rather a facilitator in helping students develop themselves. A 
According to Rogers, this requires three characteristics. Again, let me know if you're, what your teachers are like. Empathy, means you understand students. Acceptance, you have a positive attitude to students, you accept them who they are. And congruence, hmm, congruence is how things fit together. Uh, Self-honesty, desired self and behavior aligned. Um, another important factor is an understanding of leadership styles. We spoke about that. It's nice. So here, um, here are some suggestions. Um, I meant to say this earlier, but I didn't. So going back to the four stages, this is uh, Bruce Tuckman, great guy, good research, which James, my former colleague and current friend, shared with me. Forming, kind of stage one. Storming can be a bit difficult, students rebelling. Norming, things become normal. And performing is when students achieve their best. Uh, here the suggestion is that in the forming stage, there should be icebreakers. You share personal information, agree on and sign class rules. Um, I, I use the rules that were set up in my school, they were called points for pizza, and they, they kind of seem to work. I know a lot of teachers would have students write rules and then sign them. I, I, I didn't need to do that, thankfully, um, but I think it's a great method. I basically said, everyone tries their best and we respect each other. If you don't do that, get out, <laughs> which I know is quite, <laughs> is quite autocratic, but uh, I mean, Alex, you're listening, maybe other of my students here are listening. I basically just said, if you do that, your English will get better. If you do that, your maths will get better. It's very simple. People come to my classroom and they succeed. So at the start, I was just very simple. Everyone does their best and everyone respects each other. Uh, and I found less was more, actually. I, they, I'm not negotiating. If you disrespect someone because they made a mistake or you disrespect what they believe, no, that's just not happening. I don't know. That was me. I was quite short and sharp at the start. Um, the first activity I do in any English language classroom is I have uh, yeah, I have like six or seven things written on the board. Um, I've done this with every single class. It's personal information about me, but it's not in sentence form. So it'll say pink, 33, four, um, English, blah, 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 blah. And the students, first thing they have to do is guess what the information is. And some of them are completely random, like outside the box. Second thing they have to, and of course they discuss with each other what they could be, so guess I'm talking. Second thing they have to do is, uh, well, I tell them what the information is, and I say some of it is true and some of it is false. They can't all be true, they can't all be false. And students have to work together to come up with questions, so it's a little bit of writing as well, to come up with questions they can ask to find more information. But the question can't be, are you, it has to be a bit more subtle, a bit more discreet. And then they ask questions and I give the answers to those questions and then at the end individually, because it finishes individually, they have to put true or false. Uh, and then they find out a bit, bit about me. I've opened up, some of them are completely stupid. So pink is on the board uh, because my favorite shirt is pink. Maybe you've seen it in some of my videos. I wear it to weddings and things. Of course that students laugh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then after this, they, with their partner, they do the same thing. They write down information about them. They don't say what it is. It can be a bit kind of cool and interesting. It can be basic language, you know, pizza. I like pizza. True or false, you know, it can be some simple things for lower levels or more interesting for higher levels. Then they share with their pair, then they, then one or two confidence students come to the board and they, uh, people get to know each other. Fantastic icebreaker. I would recommend it for anybody learning any foreign language, not just English. It gets the students talking. They don't have an option. You just tell them to do it. Um, they get on with it. They're forced to some extent to get to know each other. I um, mean, so one of my classes, it was my Wednesday, Thursday class, six four, Wednesday, Friday class at 6.40 in the evening last year. I mean, who comes to learn English at 6.40 on Friday evening? Like, seriously, these guys are committed from 6.40 until 10 past 8 on Friday. And these guys are, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. Why are they coming to learn English? They were motivated. And they basically, uh, uh, Nikita and Kate in the class, and a couple of others basically said something like, Yep, within five minutes, everybody was talking to each other, and that was it. The whole year was sorted. It took five minutes. There was no forming, there was no norming, there was no storming. Within five minutes, they were performing. And that was because of the class. They just came in, they did this icebreaker activity, and that was it, set up for the year. Uh, there was no issues with behavior or motivation because of the time that people had obviously chosen. They were very motivated about English. Lots of them were wanting to go to university, do IELTS exams and things like this. And they just performed. Five minutes in, they performed for the entire year. Uh, brilliant class. I can name them all, but uh, 
I won't do that. So that's that's an icebreaker at the forming stage. You have a false memory of that. What's what's your memory of what I'm saying, Alice? You got to remember it, um, when I when I was teaching you and Kate and Anna and everyone else in that Nastya, Vika, Nikita, everybody else in that class. Artyom, <laughs> Artyom, Artemis. I don't remember. Uh, Ilya, he also is in that class. But uh, I just started. Maybe I didn't have this activity. Um, I did it in my second and third years, but or maybe you just forgot it was it was a while ago. Uh, what was I saying? Where am I? Ah, back to James's notes. Uh, yeah, this stage, the forming stage, the fear of the unknown should surely, slowly but surely give way to an acceptance of others in the group. I'm sure everybody can imagine a situation where they've been new in a group. How do you fit in? Like if you have a new student or a new team member, a new colleague, where, did, where, does, where does everybody fit in? It can be difficult. What's appropriate behavior? It's a teacher's job to set these activities up and allow group members to feel comfortable as soon as possible. And the activity I just spoke about was sharing personal information, true or false, and then students doing this brilliant way. I, I would do it in any classroom, not just an English classroom now. And some practical ideas for the storming um, situation. A positive enforcement of class norms and rules, feedback and behavior, rather than labeling the person. Uh, you need to be, you need to facilitate who they are, you need to be empathetic rather than saying, this is the person who's always late. This is the person who can't do this. This is the person who I don't like. This is the person I like. This is the best student. Teachers should never label other students and other students should never label other students. That's another brilliant piece of advice to improve the classroom. If you're a teacher, if you're a, if you're a student, don't label people. Because once you label someone in the back of your mind, you have that's the naughty child. No, that's that's bad, very bad. Uh, give students, you can try giving students classroom jobs, peer teaching, peer learning, group work again uh, with your partner, smart goal setting, experiences applying knowledge. The hardest thing here, and this is just James speaking, is to balance caring with not taking students' behavior personally because the storming stage can be, people are rebelling. These can be adults, little children, teenagers. And you don't want to get in conflict. You want to disengage from conflict. Uh, I'm fortunate in the last three years, I haven't had any uh, behavior issues, haven't had much of storming or much uh, conflict to deal with. Um, that's a good thing. I did when I was teaching maths and I was, I was younger. Um, quite difficult to do. I'm sure you've all had experiences of this with the teachers being finding it difficult. And it can lead to, James says, it can lead to a downward spiral of negativity. Don't do it. Uh, it's nice that the leader should always remain calm. In these, uh, in these situations. Okay, some practical advice for the norming stage. Ah, Alina. Alina, who I think after that year she moved to, did she move to the UK? So she, she went to live in the UK while I was staying in Latvia. Yeah, the truth false questions. How could I forget about it? Alina Kokina? Kokina, I think I remember. Cool surname. So yeah, some practical advice for the norming stage. Uh, more cooperative tasks, uh, dividing exercise between students. Cooperation is achieved if all participants do their assigned tasks separately and bring their results to the table. Yeah. For example, posters, I love this idea, posters on a particular environmental problem can be completed individually and then made into a group display, which can be shown around the room. That's nice, kudos. Uh, now the students are more comfortable with their role in the group, it's time to get them involved in the decision-making process of how to carry out tasks, which leads us on to performing. And maybe I'll finish up with this. Delegating is a good style here. The, the teacher, the leader, passes responsibility to the students. And go back to what I said earlier, every teacher and every learner should be a teacher, a leader, and a learner. And more collaborative tasks, which can't be done alone. Uh, Numerous studies, lots of studies, show that collaborative learning as compared to working independently results in deeper information processing and more meaningful psychological connections among participants. Now running at optimal, the best level, efficiency, group members support and respectfully challenge each other. Collaborative tasks are a great way to maintain this fusion. It can't happen every lesson, that'd be unreal, it's not life, but it's great to include every now and then. Uh, studies show that collaborative learning as compared, yeah, it basically is better. 
Now, uh, one thing I said at the start was uh, in more recent times, this is uh, 10 years after the original in 75, Bruce Tuckman came up with a fifth stage, which he calls adjourning. I'm going to put that in the comments. Adjourning. Uh, what's your question, Alex? Why do they not teach this to every teacher? Teach what to every teacher, Alex? Ah, Lina de Lela was crazy. The four stage. Well, I mean, I'll go back to James. Uh, James saw that there was a void, a gap, in the psychology involved in English language teaching, and he wanted to bridge that gap. Uh, he planned it himself. He got no money for it, got no time for it. Did a brilliant course, and your comment on Facebook made me want to do this video. I mean, uh, there's, there's six people here. Oh, wow, got six people here. Fantastic. Uh, there's been so much stuff said here. I mean, if you folks, if you're watching anywhere, get yourself to that link. The, the blog's incredible. I'm also going to, I, I put a couple of links in there. You should go and check them out. These four stages of group group dynamics are incredible. It works in every situation. It's not just a classroom. You can tell I'm getting passionate about it again. Uh, Christopher. Hi, Christopher. Ah. You're in my uh, my wonderful island of Ireland. I'm still here. You've joined two hours and one minute into it. It's it's great to have you here. Say hello. We're we're just sharing. Uh, we're just sharing experiences about the classroom, Christopher. If you've had a positive or a negative experience in the classroom, send send a little comment and, and someone will uh, someone will speak to you. I'm sure. See, so yeah, at last stage is adjourning. Adjourning is how something ends. <clears throat> So the, I'll put this here in the comments. Uh, this is something called the peak end rule. Um, I mean, really, I need you to, yeah, if you're listening, um, go to this link so you can actually see the picture, please. Yeah, so click the link I put in the comments and go to the bottom and it's called, it's called the peak end rule. Again, this is, this is something very simple that any student, any teacher, any leader, any learner can take away, the peak end rule. So don't underestimate, please make sure you're looking in the link, don't underestimate the power of the ending. A negative ending could have detrimental, bad effects on future L2, that's your not your native language learning experiences. Indeed, a student's memory of learning English in a particular group will be shaded, can be affected, by how it ends, as the peak end rule suggests. You can see in the little picture here, things go up and down and up and down and up and down, and there's a peak about a third of the way through, and then a dip. You want a peak at the end. Uh, James's suggestions here are end of course celebration. Each student responsible for an area of the celebration, end of year certificates, presentation, and favorite moments. Um, here's James's conclusion, I'll read it. To conclude, the group can be a powerful learning tool when its collective force is properly Harnessed. Part of our job as a teacher is to adapt our leadership style and the activities we provide to make the group more cohesive, which supports our ultimate goal for learning to take place in the classroom and for students to have a positive impetus to continue learning English in the future. This isn't just about learning English, it's any subject, any business, any, any situation where there's a group, super important. So the peak end rule, like if you take nothing away from this video, these are the two things, finish well because that's how people remember things. And then the other one was every teacher and every learner should be a teacher, a leader and a learner. They're the two things that I would absolutely take away from this video. Ah, hey, Christopher, what is, it, what is it you love about psychology? What is it you love about psychology? Have you, have you studied it? I'm not, an, I'm not an expert in psychology, I've just shared uh, I've just shared some things about, about group dynamics, the dynamics that I'm passionate about, that Alex, who's here in the comments, and my former colleague and current friend, James, sort of gave me some ideas. I really wanted to share them. So yeah, the peak end rule is super important. Folks, it's been two hours, five minutes. There's still a few of you here. If you have any questions, I will answer them. So I'll give you give you a few seconds for that. 
I just got I just got a really funny comment. Someone, one of my British and American videos, do not ask an American for a rubber. Yeah. Yeah, don't do that. That's a <laughs> that's a very important false friend. Or not false, not false friend. That's one word. American English and uh, British English are a little different. But that's a, that's an entirely different topic. Uh, if you're still here, um, Monday's video will be on maths, by the way. It's going to be how to solve linear equations. You can have a whiteboard. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was a maths teacher for eight years. I studied maths at university. Um, I'm looking to get into maths tuition as well as kind of what I'm doing in English teaching. So I thought I'd make a video on maths. If you're interested, check it out. See if it gets some traction on YouTube. So folks, how are we doing time-wise here? Any, any last requests before I go? Any questions, any comments, anything to say? It's been great having you all here. Can't believe again we've gone for two hours and six minutes. It's, it's incredible. Da, da, da. If you want me to, I'm gonna have this. It's always with me. Do you want me to share any idioms? I can always do that. I actually I had a student earlier today um, from, from Saudi Arabia. And <laughs> she booked a one hour lesson. Oh, up to seven people, yay. Um, she had booked a she booked a one hour lesson, and I asked her what she'd done this morning, and you know she said about breakfast and all that stuff. Kind of intermediate student, and she said she had eggs, and I took the opportunity let let's explore egg vocabulary. So we talked about all the different types of eggs, um, boiled eggs, poached eggs, scrambled eggs, Easter eggs, omelet, um, then all the different vocabulary: egg shell, yolk, egg white, all the parts of the body of a chicken, blah blah blah. And then I asked her about idioms, and we looked at by 10 different idioms that involve the word egg, um, which is absolutely fantastic. Not very vegan. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry if there's anybody here who gets offended by me talking about eggs, I apologize. Uh, but that's, uh, that's what this student did. So I'm just wondering if there's any idioms here with egg in this book. This is about the idiom. Oh yeah, we, we, yeah, we looked at one of them a couple of weeks ago to teach like, someone's grandmother to suck eggs. Not so interesting. Um, <laughs> like, do you have, I'm going to put here in the comments, do you, I don't know what languages we've got here, people watching, got Portuguese, got Russian, Latvian. Do you have the, do you have these phrases in, in your language? Someone, would you call someone a good egg? Would you call someone a bad egg? That's a, kind of some language we have, uh, we have in my country. Why am I still going? Two hours and eight minutes. It's crazy. Hmm. Basically, a good egg is a dependable, trustworthy person, and a bad egg is an untrustworthy person. You can't depend on And here's the explanation. <clears throat> Very ambiguous in Latvian or Russian. So, you <laughs> so yeah. In fact, the <laughs> okay, yeah, it sounds a bit funny. I've never heard anybody say that, neither Russian or Latvian, Alex. Like what would, like if you said to someone, just word for word translation, he's a bad egg, would that mean anything? What would that mean in, in Russian or Latvian? Um, so here we go. It is impossible to tell from simply looking at the shell whether an egg is fresh or not. Uh, once an egg is broken, it may reveal an unpleasant surprise, but a good egg will be sound to its very center. So it is with people. <laughs> The outward appearance will not reveal the content of the character. This is only discovered when time is taken to get to know them better. A bad egg is someone to avoid, but a good egg is totally dependable. And as the 19th century American newspaper editor Charles A. Dana put it, all the goodness of a good egg cannot make up for the badness of a bad one. It would be perceived in a way relating to the phrase, said the actress to the bishop. Okay. Interesting. The term bad egg was the first to appear around the mid 19th century, perhaps as public school slang. An 1864 edition of the political and literary magazine Athentium defined a bad egg as a fellow, a chap, a man, who had not proved to be as good as his promise. The corresponding good egg did not come into use until the early 20th century. There is a suggestion in Compton Mackenzie's novel Sinister Street from 1913 that it may have been coined among students at Oxford. Oxford was divided into bad men and good eggs. 
Given the likely public school and Oxbridge origins of the phrases, it is not too surprising that they find their most natural home in the upper class world, P.G. Woodhouse. In 1940, he even published a collection of stories entitled Eggs, Beans and Crumpets. Nowadays, the expressions have something of a self-conscious, antiquated ring. Here's a quote from Elton John, <laughs> the singer. There was a movie about him recently, wasn't there? Rocket Man. Did anyone see it? Anybody see Rocket Man? Is it good? Should I go and watch it? Um, I think Peter's tactics are sometimes wrong, but I thought what he did against Mugabe was incredibly brave. And he's doing good work in a world where most people are too timid. So yes, I think Peter Tatchell is a good egg. And here's one from the Daily Mail. The former Taliban leader is undoubtedly a bad egg, but the fact that he rides a motorbike is for me a point in his favor. That's a strange quote from the Daily Mail. Anyway, that's enough. Folks, this is the last opportunity. We've looked at lots and lots of stuff today. Thank you to everybody who has shown up, everybody who has commented, everybody who has listened, everybody who has shared. Any last questions? Rocketman is brilliant. Ah, hello, Nastya. Two hours and 11 minutes. And that's, that is the first comment, fantastic. Uh, no spoilers, so I won't ask anything more. How do I raise, Colin? Hang on, Alex, do you mean how do I raise or how do I rise? And why do you want to raise your cholesterol levels? Your cholesterol levels are dangerously low, that is rare, that usually doesn't happen. Yeah, how do you raise them? Well, why, I don't know, ask Google. Could ask my sister, she's a clinical oncologist, deals with skin cancer. Just seeing if anyone else has commented on my Instagram stories, if they've got anything good to say, I don't want to leave people out. Ah, yes, the Chelka stories, I don't know who you are. They say that the relationship between teacher and students is very important because if a teacher and students dislike each other, studies aren't so good. I agree. And that's it. That's my, that's one final comment from the chill stories. Hmm. They're 50% below absolute minimum. Let's, let's put that in Google, Alex. Have you done that? Like I know if you eat, if you take cream, if you take cream and like butter and stuff like this, I mean, you should have taken tablets to raise your cholesterol. Olive oil, uh, nine, you do this yourself. Consume olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil may be more health, health, healthy. Low carb, exercise regularly, add coconut oil, stop smoking. Lose weight, choose purple produce, eat fatty fish often, oily fish. There you go, there's some suggestions for you. Uh, I'm not, I'm breaking the rules of how you use the internet and I didn't check the source. I didn't check the authenticity of the credibility. So if that's wrong, I apologize. See if anybody has said anything on Facebook, I don't think they have. Ah, yeah, vegan, so you can't. It's not so good. Hmm. Right, folks, I'm going to finish off there. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Um, I'll probably try and go again live next Thursday. I'm away the, the weekend after that. Um, so I'll try and go Thursday. We'll see how it goes. If you have a topic, please let me know. Um, thank you to James, who obviously provided lots of the content for this video and Alex who sent me the Facebook message to make the video happen. Uh, yeah, so thanks again everybody for watching. I hope it's been helpful. If it has been helpful, you know, I've got to say this, smash the like button and comment and all that stuff. You've been commenting, it's been great. I will see you guys later.